Ending the cycle one. Large map, uh, three infernal enemies. I have a feeling I know who it is, but... Ending the cycle one. The moon overhead behaves no differently in Devoloku than it does in this Tokyo. It waxes and wings, marking the cyclical flow of times as regular in, it, in its motions as the cycle of reincarnation. Several yugas came and went alongside the changing phases of the moon, bringing down certain feelings within me almost to nothing. Yet now, having been pierced through the same attack as on that fateful day, those feelings stir within me anew. Varuna Kamadeva, my primordial worm who trapped me in this cycle. Ever since you shot me with the arrow that awakened these feelings of desire, I have hated you, loathed you, detested you. Yet, it's strange. I cannot say exactly what it is about you that I hate. I thought I abhorred the fact that you lumped me with these feelings, but... As primordial worm, you two must have had predetermined fate thrust upon you by the world you once called home. For you were once trapped in the endless loop of Yugas as well, having your existence and beliefs steadily worn away by the repetitive passage of time. You know what it is to live in a world where your role determines everything and everything is preordained, right down to the person with whom you will fall in love. Yet even in th that world of endless cycles and compulsory fates, somehow, you alone seem to be a free being. And when at last, you left me with your love, you seem to smile happily. How is that possible? What did you have to be happy about when you were fading from the world? Now, I see the reason for my journey could never truly have been hatred. Now I remember. Yes, I have recalled something I had long forgotten. The wish I made the day I arrived in this Tokyo. I simply wanted to understand. What was it that drove you to shoot me today, Varuna Kamadeva? Was I somehow special to you? That is what I wanted to know. In a world where even those we would come to love and desire were prearranged, my feelings toward you alone seemed real. My own. This is a new song. I merely wanted an answer. I believe that it was something someone could answer for me. However, I was utterly wrong. Now I see that it was a question only I could answer. And only when I do will the wheels of my perpetual cycle cease to turn at last. Earlier in Kabukicho. Curse you! I was so close. So close to obtaining Mahakala's rule and becoming all-powerful. So close to stirring the many corpses from their slumber beneath the city. So close to using their regrets to get my revenge. So close to obtaining powers of omnipotence and omniscience that would have eclipsed even those of a Matarasu, with which I could have defied the many fences and parted the many clouds. It is not over. I still have plenty of soldiers at my disposal. I still have a chance. With this, Daikaku, or as he might well be called, the shadow of Okuninushi fades into darkness. Huh. This looks like back alley in Kokubicho. Guess that means we made it. Tearing through the darkness through sheer force of will, Ellie leads her two companions out into the light. Mm, it certainly looks that way to me. Thank you, Ellie. It's been some time since I was able to move about like that. Released at last from the stifling confines of Daikaku's great darkness, Tsukiyomi is all smiles. Relax, Ellie. I don't know where he's gone, but he's far from here now. Though, judging by the crafty look in his eyes when he left, I'm positive he's not giving up on his plots of yet. 
Hey, Tsukiyomi. What is it, my queen? It's not like you to look so grave. Hmm, what did he mean by m many fences and many clouds? Do you know? Mm, that, that is part of a little song from my homeland. It references Yaegaki and Yakumo, which technically means eight boundaries and eight clouds. However, mm, the number eight is not literal, but is used to signify all creation, all things, and the power of the gods who oversee them. Hence, many fences, many clouds. Eight means everything, huh? You don't say. For a moment, Nellie stares down at her feet, suddenly deep in thought. Then her neck snaps up with a start. I just remembered. I've got to do something. It shouldn't take long. Think you can hold on forward for me, Tsukiyomi. Tsukiyomi seems quite shocked, but he quickly recovers, flashing Ellie his usual grin in the bow. Oh, what an unexpected honor. It's rare of you to leave someone else in charge. You're concerned about them, aren't you? The Kabukicho Guild, I mean. My apologies. I'm sure my absence must have made things difficult for you. Tsukiyomi, known in this town as the King of the Night, considers the fact that Ellie is not once of Kabukicho. While she would not willingly admit it herself, part of the reason for that must, he thinks, having to protect her fellow guild members. No, of course not. I've just been doing whatever I want, and... Right now, I have something I need to do elsewhere. That's all there is to it. It's really no big deal. I understand. You can count on me, my beautiful queen. Come back soon, yes? Hmm. Hold on. Before you go, I need some answers. Why did he save me? Did you want me to owe you? Did you want me to think you were not dumb anymore? Huh? All right. You are still here. <laughs> what do you mean I'm still here? How could you forget that? I ran through you, remember? Mm, well, anyway, as for your question. If you want me to answer that, you'll have to do me a favor first. I need some help with something. What? Seriously? Oh, yeah. And speaking of owing people things, I need to pay everything back big time. With that, Ellie spreads her wings and takes off, heading for the north of uh, Kabukicho. <clears throat> when your double dragon attack pierces Shiva Mahakala, the great darkness enshrouding Balor immediately wavers. Momentarily wavered. Excellent work. I couldn't be more proud of you, my grandchild. Or should I say, Arison? However, it only lasts for a moment. The darkness quickly ensnares Balor yet again, and this time... He fades away into nothingness alongside the other shadow soldiers. Hmm. Did Daikaku bring them with him? Huh? Where do you think you're going, you big lug? Damn it! I really got in a bite. Come back here! Whoa. What the? Oh, uh, what's happening? The ground is falling apart. <laughs> Holy. Makan. Anvari. Get a load of that. <laughs> Following a clash of Shiva, Mahakala is flooded with the bright light cast by a certain rule. I've seen this before. That's light made by an exception. <laughs> What's going on now? The whole world's breaking. As far as the eye can see, Earth and Sky begin to crumble as if they are slowly being dissolved, and trickle toward Mahakala and the stream of the debris. <laughs> I'm being pulled up! I can't tell up from down anymore. I'm getting drawn in. But before long, things like up and down lose all meaning as everything is drawn into Mahakala with increasing rapidity and order ceases to exist. Exception confirmed. The power of infinite rules is flowing into Mahakala as they speak. Mm. 
Be careful. Whoa! The ground is swept away, leaving you and your friend to whirl around in the air like specks of dust in a hurricane, bereft of all sense of balance. Can't go! I feel dizzy. Where's the ground? I miss the ground! Calm yourselves! You are no immediate danger. Be calm, I say! What you see before you is a primordial chaos. This is what the world looked like before there was a distinction between land and sky. You! What did you get here? Marduk! I'm so glad you're okay. Yes, I am well. Not only that, but I know what is going on in Tokyo. And I understand your position in the scheme of things. Huh? I thought you lost your memories. Wait, are you saying? Did you get your memories back? Hmm, no. But I've been told what I needed to know. That's right! I brought him up to speed. How's it going, Arison? Uh, have you met before? You're pretty buff for a kid. Who are you calling a kid? Ah, oh, jeez, you never learn, do you? I can't tell you how many times I've heard that from you. Anyway, anyway. I'm only gonna say this once in your lifetime, so listen up, okay? I am Tina, Lord of the Sun and ruler of the skies above the Ryukyu Kingdom. I am also world representative of Nirai Kanai. Sounds familiar? No? Well, maybe it's left. I'm with the Warmongers. What? You're world rep? <laughs> See? That's why I like you. Your reaction's so precious, Arison. You've got to be kidding me. How can a cocky squirt like this be in the Warmongers? They all judge people by their looks. You wouldn't want someone to do that to you. They think you're all brawn and no brains. What did you just say to me? Kengo, he's just a kid. Don't let Kengo scare you. He's okay. Could he really be a world rep? Eh, don't worry about it. Respect isn't demanded. It's earned. And I always earn it. Sooner or later. Hey, kid. If you're really in warmongers, are you planning on challenging us like your friend there? Hmm. <laughs> Really? <laughs> Naturally I am. Not! <laughs> you should have seen the look on your faces! Anyway, to be honest, I'm not really interested in a fight here now. Huh? What's that supposed to mean? Well, you know you're the prize, right? Then you probably also know that what we in a war monkeys really want is to go head to head with you, the prize. That's why, in past loops, we've all seen your... end. So I got to thinking, is that really how I want things to be? He made old Belor, right? When he felled you. And that's when he decided to lock himself in that dungeon and throw away the key. He turned his back on the game entirely. Huh. So, do you see now why I don't want to fight you here? I sort of do. But what about Marduk? You'll have to ask him yourself. How about it, Marduk? My heroic duty is to pursue the deadly Taimat wherever it spawns. Taimat is not an individual, but a manifestation of chaos and ruin that occurs when several worms converge in one location. It brings chaos upon the world and misfortune upon people. I cannot let it go unchecked. However, it would appear that you are not yet on the verge of creating such chaos, Arathen. As such, I am willing to prioritize resolving the current situation over my enmity with you. Glancing around at the mayhem unfolding in your midst, Marduk draws himself up, looking and sounding every bit the valiant hero. After all, to allow such chaos as this to continue would fly in the face of everything I stand for. Does that mean you two are actually on my side? Yes, but only temporarily. To be clear, a truce is last only as long as it takes to restore order to this world. Eh, yeah, I wouldn't say I'm your ally either. I just kept letting us get their hands on you. You're mine, okay? Nobody will have you but me, Arthur. It's a shame, but I understand. I still appreciate the help. Well, I can't deny that part of it is about getting back at the ones behind this whole thing. Yeah, these two haven't been trained, like, super mega fucked. I have a pretty good idea who's involved. One wily butler, one scheming fiend, 
And I'm pretty sure Guildmaster's in one too. So Yori Chomo and uh, Mephistopheles seems to have been consorting with something. Anyway, first things first. We'll have to do something about this situation. You saw what happened earlier, right? That was an exception in the making. The reason everything went through so well just now is probably the exception's rule went out of control. Tough to think of it. This all started when you and Shiva collided, Arathon. If that's true, then Shiva must be somewhere in this exception territory. We just need to drag him out and... Do the usual. Designate a hierarchy. You make it sound easy, but how are you meant to get past all this twisting stuff? I can barely move, let alone see. What are you supposed to do? As I said before, what you see around you is nothing less than primordial chaos. That is, the state of the world in which no distinctions exist between light and dark, heaven and earth. In other words, what we need to do is create those distinctions. For only by parting this chaos can we find on we seek. To put it simply, we'll create the world anew. I mean, in theory, maybe, but... Do you dare underestimate us? Of course we can do it! Do you realize who you're talking to? Really? Like, really, really? Have you done it before? Peter grins, lifts his fiery bow off his back, and knocks an arrow. You don't get to call yourself a world representative unless you have at least one or two memories of creating a world before. <laughs> True. He pauses, flashing you a dazzling smile as he treats you like his favorite one-liner. Behold! And prepare to fall for me all over again, Erthen. As my celestial bow is a sacred artifact, let it be the weapon that can create order from chaos, part land and sky. Fly, Mushusu! It is time to create this world anew. Dang, those two are cool. You can't let them show us up, huh, Air partner? Uh, you okay? Yeah, I just... I heard a voice just now. What the heck? Mr. Mononobe? And I'm pretty sure it was Mr. Mononobe. Is he calling me? Huh? <laughs> what are you talking about? It's a feed boss. How apt. These are pretty. I've never seen these before. It's like a wall. Did we need to separate these two? I'm not even sure what this is. Okay, let's give this a try. Uh, first things first. Want to, everyone is done type. Amazing. And everyone is <laughs> double locked. <laughs> God damn it. Okay, that was more straightforward than I expected. Just like the Berserkers and dozens of other guilds in Tokyo, each of the three true guilds is presided over by the Guildmaster. 
As for the warmongers to the west, a young boy with an entirely mechanical body who goes by the name of Bertra fills this role. Like Duo, he was created in a certain research facility as part of a series of bioengineering experiments. He is endowed with enhanced artificial intelligence, and he holds within him a sacred artifact containing the world's memories. Like the other children who took part in these experiments, he was given the task of furthering and accelerating research and human evolution. In particular, his subject was progress through battle, known as Plan B, within the confines of the laboratory in which he was stationed. Thus he was given the role of inciting conflict within the game carried out through the app in this Tokyo, as well as recording its progress. All this time, Mercho has continued to monitor and record the game. For so long now that he has all but forgotten that he used to be human. Engrave my name of Marduk unto thee, Celestial Bow, I command you to part the sky and land with a single arrow. Marduk's arrow pierces primordial chaos, separating heaven and earth along its trajectory. As it does. Engrave my name of Tidon to thee! Flood the darkness with your radiant light! Arrow of the sun! Tidon's shot flies straight through the gap of Mar that Marduk created, f following along in the wake of his celestial arrows, casting a bl blinding light in all directions. Tidon, look over there! Amid the primordial chaos, he can just make out something that vaguely looks like an egg. It behaves very strangely, seeming to pulse and throb in place. What's that thing? This Mr. Munanobi's pent up. There is no way for you to know, but what you're looking at is the memory of a world that once was, or rather, its shell. This is a collection of memories that were discarded by the world. This is what Mahakala, Guardian of Shadows, has been protecting. That's gotta be it. That's the whole thing we were looking for. <laughs> what the heck? Before your very eyes, the, the egg begins to crack, and with a moment, someone emerges from within. I was dreaming. Dreaming of a peaceful Yuga. You. Are you Varuna Kamadeva? Hey! Someone's watching us! I can feel it! Coward! Come out where we can see you! Sensing a gaze beyond the walls of primordial chaos, Marduk and Tita sense a volume of arrows into the darkness. As the darkness unfolds into light, your vision gradually clears and you see. Holy fucking shit. <laughs> that is my reaction. <laughs> Am I going crazy or is that? <laughs> Can't be the moon. It's way too big. But it definitely looks like one. Hello, humans! Rejoice! For you have front and row seats to the test of launch of my ultimate weapon. You! How dare you show your face before me, Guildmaster Bircho! You mean this kid is a warmonger's Guildmaster? Da da! I'm Bircho! Bircho, 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 the boy with the body of a machine introduced himself before descending into a, a st staticky stream of laughter and garbled words. Okay, so I thought they were just dropping chunks, but apparently <laughs> that was just like uh, a double a trap where now they're actually dropping the moon. Holy shit. What's with this kid? He looks like he's got a screw loose. You mean you didn't find it funny? I found repetition quite hilarious myself. Don't all humans love repetition? You made such a habit of it. You follow the same routine day in, day out. You laugh at the same things over and over again. And just look at the history of war. 
Uh, these many loops, that always makes me chuckle. Not only do you keep your conflict on repeat, but with every repetition, things get worse and worse too. That's the spirit of human advancement. So, I decided to prepare a treat for you, you warmongering humans. The ultimate weapon to end this war, or as you like to call it, game. Ultimate weapon, you say? Are you talking about Makakala? Ah, yet. Oh, yet. If that's what you think, I'm afraid you're under entirely wrong assumption. Teed of Nira, can I? My ultimate weapon is... Uh, that! <laughs> I mean, that is pretty ultimate shit. Bertro's arm swings straight up uh, to point at the sky. The moon. It's falling. And we didn't notice all the time because of a fucking spoke. That was just the moon drops. Ah! With a deafening rumble, the thing that looks like a colossal moon begins to plummet toward the ground. Lots of bosses this time around. This is probably just going to be Bertro and... Um, <laughs> I don't know what the other boss is, but it might be just a mob. Ending the cycle to a large map. Oh, she was on her side. Sacred Artifact level 100 Shiva. Um, it might be worth spamming. <laughs> uh, spamming his charge, that is. Alright, maybe this will be good, but we'll see. I see. So this is the endgame of the Warmongers Operation Mahakala. Well, I suppose I shouldn't call it Warmongers Plan. Only a select few of them actually had anything to do with it. Seven world representatives belong to the Warmongers Guild in the West. Three of them were involved in this plan. Add to that guild master and another collaborator and you have a party of five culprits. Hmm. Yeah, true. Daikaku's... I guess, uh... I, I forgot that Daikaku wasn't a world rep. The three world representatives involved represent the Land of War, Devaloka, and Gehenna. Well, to be precise, the middle one wasn't really involved, but that is actually a key point of the strategy in question. And Devaloka. Creation, sustainment, and destruction continue in an endless cycle. Shiva is the transient with the rule of destruction. Possessing a rule that allows one to bring about the complete destruction of the world is a rarity, even among world representatives. If such a power could be channeled into a weapon, it would give the wielder an enormous advantage over their peers. However, from the moment he arrived in this Tokyo, Shiva has refused to accept his role and has kept his third eye shut tight. The other four culprits plotted to use Shiva's role-destroying rule for their own ends. In fact, these four w wondered if they couldn't have used someone else to accomplish the goals in Shiva's place. Perhaps someone with the same role as Shiva would have been more willing to accept it and collaborate. Of course, to test the theory, they first needed to find someone who possessed the role of destruction. As for how they managed that. First, they contacted Mahakala, the exception sealed deep with in the earth beneath Tokyo, and gained their cooperation. I expect that's why they built a fortress in Hikari Gaoka. It serves as one giant exception territory. Then they sent Mahakala into the region chosen as the battlefield for the war between the three true guilds. They proceeded to divide the battle into two layers, one to serve as Devaloka and the other as Shangri-La. Hmm. Once that was done, they just needed a rule to link them. The one held by that ring. Using the power of the ring, they funneled Mahakala's memories into Shiva's body. Shiva and Mahakala became one, allowing them to wield the rule of world destruction. However, though they may have shared a body, they are still two separate entities. Upon finding a strong opponent, Shiva could not help but challenge them presently, as is his way.
This caused an exception, likely because of a contradiction fates. It probably had something to do with the hierarchy between Shiva, Mahakala, and the 23 souls that reside within the opponent in question. In Devaloka, Shiva prevails against Varuna Kamadeva. However, in Shangri-La, things are reversed in battle against Shiva M Mahakala. He loses, despite possessing the same rule as Devaluka Shiva. It's a little bit complicated, so let me boil it down to a single point, lest we get sidetracked. Those at the center of the game carried out in this Tokyo deemed this conflict the one to which the hierarchy could not be applied. And so Mahakala became an exception. They spun out of control, devouring time and space alike. Having sucked up the entirety of space, including the moon, they are, at this very moment, prepared to send it all crashing down to Earth. If allowed to hit, the impact will bury everything within the wall under a massive chunk of debris, sealing them away forever. In other words, it will become a physical battle zone, and nothing will be reset. Oh, so the moon will act as a, uh, like a ceiling barrier? Just like the wall that surrounds the 23 worlds in this Tokyo. So that would be irreversible too, then. Tokyo and the other many worlds weren't always surrounded by a giant wall. Breaking it is what caused the contradictions like this to occur. That's why what happened in Shangri-La and Devaloka. They were one world once. You see, Varuna, one of the 23 wanderers and the exile of Shangri-La, has another side. The three-faced, six-armed Ashura. Osei looks up at the colossal moon speeding towards the earth. Now we face the final stages of Operation Mahakala. But the one behind all this orchestrated because... Mm. Mm. What am I doing here? That's right, I, I collided with that exception then. Do not fret. I have no will to fight you at the present moment. I've lost to you. And your friends. So rejoice, Varuna Kamadeva. For you have won! I know that. I know who you are, Erthen. We have spent time together in a previous loop. Though, of course. Of course, you would not remember that, would you? It is meaningless for me to bring up such things. You never change. I suppose, of the two of us, I am the only one who has changed. You always reach out your hand irrespective of time, or place, or the nature of the person you're trying to help. It's like you do it without thinking. I do think about it, actually. Besides, people have always helped me first. I just want to return the favor. Hmm. Which came first, I wonder. Did you extend your hand, or did another reach for yours? Throughout the ceaseless cycles of Yuga, you, all of you, in fact, have continued to uphold this present of mutual aid. Yet I, by failing you that day, I fear I broke the cycle for good. As I said earlier, this Tokyo did once see a peaceful Yuga. You spent your days with students from various schools, sometimes in tears, sometimes in laughter, at times busy, at others more relaxed. Then a loop began because the majority of people in this Tokyo wished for an eternal paradise. Mm -hmm. See, it might be hard to believe, but there was a time when the world representatives sh shunned bloodshed and worked together and maintained peace. Really? That is hard to believe, honestly. It was during such a yuga that I attended school alongside you. 
It was after a certain loot had ended that everything changed. Things started to break down. So... It wasn't everyone's objective to just... Have me killed? Always? Hmm. For the first time in the history of Olives, someone had killed you. At first, the world representatives believed that it had been the result of an accident. So this was before all the loops that I ended up dying. However, it just kept happening. Time and time again, you wound up dead. Eventually, even the world representatives partook in the killing. And in the end, so did I. Who was the first one to kill me then? That was the impetus for all this. Well, maybe not the impetus for this looping, but it certainly was the impetus for the warring. The information warrior that has persisted across all these loops. Just as I did back in my homeworld on that fateful day. I felled you, Arthur. It was after this that our registrar began to act strangely. I believe that the repetition of the Kali Yuga, the Age of Vice and Discord, gradually became unbearable. And that registrar you mentioned, what are you talking about? <laughs> Alas, Shiva, the calamitous age of which you speak will finally end today. Good Master Bircho. Well, show us, placebo, Shiva. My ultimate weapon is complete at least, and it's all thanks to you. Behold, the exception of Shangri-La. Our rampaging rule with the rule of the void that exists only to suck up space and time. <laughs> I have engineered nothing less than a black hole, capable of devouring all existence, if Mahakal's rule continues to spiral out of control. Everything will be returned to its original state of chaos, and Mahakal will consume it all. That includes the only gap that exists in the walls surrounding this Tokyo. The great, big blue thing that you like to call the sky. <laughs> when the moon comes crashing down to the earth, everything will become a battle zone. We'll all be trapped in our graves, and the loop will be no more. How dare you do something like that without consulting me? This puts me firmly on the side of those who will defeat you. How about you, Marduk? Are you going to aid me or throw your lot in with them? I am with you, Tito, for the sun, for I am a hero. I could never be party to something so villainous as bringing the world to ruin, nor can I stand by while chaos runs unchecked. Eh, Procrast, though. If that is how you feel, then I hope you have something more powerful than the ultimate destruction on your side. <laughs> I look forward to seeing the outcome of this battle. After all, history has paved with war. Conflict is how humankind has formed its path to greater heights. To do battle... It's to develop, to do war, is to evolve. That is what Plan B has sought from the very beginning. <laughs> Dozens of shadow began to pour forth from the darkness and bubbling Malakala, clearly prepared to defend them. Well... This is it. I might not have a clue what's going on, but I know that much. It's time for the final battle, huh? <laughs> this music. Hey, partner, you okay? You better not be thinking of doing something stupid. I saw you use your double dragon. You think I didn't know what that that's to you? Don't try and hide things from me. She told me about what happened to Penitentia. You can't move much, right? One of my arms works fine. <sighs> Only half of me is paralyzed. I only need one hand to hold my sword. Partner. I'll be fine. Really. Anyway, let's finish this together. We just have to win this last battle. Well, alright. But remember, you can lean on me anytime, okay? We're in this together. <laughs> Shiva watches your exchange with Kengo with an unreadable expression. Thinking about a time, many loops ago, when the two of you shared a camaraderie. A time when you would help one another, lean on one another, and sh share in each other's lives. 
And I destroyed that. Hey, you lot! In case you haven't noticed, the moon's about to come crashing down on our heads. I hope we have a plan. Come to think of it, can I go? It's about time I told you the secret of your sacred artifact. Huh? My sacred artifact has a secret? Neat! It does. I probably should have told you this a long time ago, eh, but you're built of power. Uh, yes? You're wearing it wrong, and it's meant to be worn as a belt, dummy, not as an armband. It's all in the name. <laughs> I just couldn't bring myself to tell you. I made the same mistake myself once, and, uh, well, I didn't want to embarrass you. <laughs> I did not expect this from Sore. <laughs> Looking a little sheepish, sheepish. <laughs> Keiko removes the sacred fact from his forearm and fastens it around his waist instead. Even though it's still on his arm. <laughs> Whoa, you're right. Nope, it's still on his arm. Can you feel it? You can feel it, right? Nice, isn't it? Now, with every coil around your waist, your strength will double. And this is incredible. It's like I can feel the power building in my stomach. It's like I have had two skill evolutions twice in a row. Kengo's rule of infinitude creates a spiral of lightning within the center of his vein, which crackles down his power as it coils and spins. He can feel that not only his five primary senses, a taste, touch, smell, sight, and hearing, but also his sits and summon senses are now fully active, proprioception and magnetoception, obviously. He knows with every fiber of his being that his power could take him anywhere he wished. Alright, let's do this, partner. I am so ready. With power like this, I've got nothing to be scared of. Where's the face bomb option? Look at you, getting all excited. Reminds me of my old self. But embarrassing, really. Oh, speaking of old, I wonder what's keeping Odin. He never fails to show when some catastrophe like this hits. I thought for sure he'd be here by now. Anyway, no time for reminiscing. I have to watch out for these kids. Hmm. Shiva's eyes betray a smile as he watches Yon Kengo set off together, arm in arm. Ready, Kengo. We're going to stop Mahakala. I wonder if it is really too late. Oh. What am I saying? Shiva mumbles to himself, screwing his eyes shut. When he opens them again a moment later, there's a glint of steel in them that wasn't there before. That's for no one to decide but me. The world cannot decide it for me, nor can any interloper. Only I can say what those past cycles meant to me. With that, Shiva opens his eyes wide and dashes forth, falling in your wake. Okay, I guess I will not have any charge on the side. Oh, never mind, I can get a charge in. Yamate, go to side! Okay, just take full damage. Uh, oh sweet, he has his charge. I do not know how to beat this boss. <laughs> okay. Well, it's good, I guess. Buff reversal. Lame. Um... Wait, that doesn't come off? God damn it. Oh, 
<laughs> wow, this is slow. I didn't realize bosses can move to the side like that. Don't kill me! Don't kill me! How many turns is this? Okay, two more turns. We need to level four more turn. <laughs> this is not good. Um, I'm gonna try to heal. Why is he to the side like this? I don't understand. What is the function of him moving to the side like this? Oh crap, he already has his charge. Well, these guys are possibly done next turn. So I'm gonna need to do some serious damage. Now that buff reversal is over, hopefully I can. Does he have a skill? I don't think he has. He doesn't. God, if only this would actually kill, but I don't think it'd be that hype. He don't, he's not getting quick from this. Oh my god, he did it! Yes! <laughs> Way too poetic. God, yes! Party indeed. Rule of the wander. Rule of rending. Engrave my name unto thee. Come forth, boundless tail! Truly an amazing moment. 
<laughs> what is this stuff? I can't tell if I'm falling or sinking or what? How's this? Can you walk now? Ali uses a rule of Nightwalker to control the chaotic darkness, creating steps of Mach, uh, for Makan to walk on. Yeah, works for me, and uh, who are you? Mm, name's Ellie. I'm Kabuki Show's Guildmaster. I'm just doing what I can to repay a favor I owe our friend Arthur. Ellie says, casting a sidelong glance at you. Anyway, shall we deal with those shadows? They'll be a piece of cake for me to handle. The kind I could eat for breakfast. Without waiting for a response, Ellie speeds towards the shadow soldiers with a flap of her rings. Dang! Looks like I have competition. Bring it on! Oh wait! Kasuga, you made it! I heard the second I was getting back up, but then I remembered. My body's made of flames and that nothing can actually break me! Really? Hope I'm not too late. I'm here to help out too. Makan! Bollocks! I'm Mari! Gamer and friends here! Oh! So you all made it out safely, did ya? Good. Last I heard, you're trapped somewhere. We were, until a certain fairy producer saved us. Kawaii! Personally, I don't didn't really want to get involved. But apparently the Street Shrew Guilds are hell-bent on dragging me into this, so here I am. <laughs> what are you talking about? Did something happen? I'll explain later, bollocks. No time now. Anyway, see you in a bit. Dwarven Changeling! <laughs> Leave this to Garmer! Bane of Tear! My apologies for the delay, Berserkers. Allow me to join you for this dance. Snow! So you're here to fill your belly too, aren't you? <laughs> this is gonna be a feast to remember! I am, yes. No matter any others or pieces, not ready to be played as of yet. So I shall be falling in for them in time being. Even though, is not Mad really a Berserker? Isn't he like a, an everyman in every guild? Well, I guess it's fine if he has like one stable guild. You be gone from my path. Come, Marduk, let us cut a sway through their ranks. Hurrah! You can count on me, Tita. I shall open up the way. Like this. Alright, here goes nothing. Time to give you some of this juice, partner. Hold on, Kingo. You don't know what you're doing with that. Let me help. Together, Kengo and Thor sends bolts of lightning from their belts, a power shuddering into you. The electricity crackles through your veins, elevating you to the same level of power as the two of them. Nice one, Kengo. Thanks, Thor. Let's do the same. At your words, the two charge through the chaos ahead like a pair of dancing dragons, spiraling and whirling, fast as lightning. Hit me! Take this, Drake Batcher! As the Berserkers make use of the paths made by Ellie and Marduk, your combined attack with Kengo finds its mark. Mahagala. Heh! <laughs> the attack lands, and sh should have been effective. W wouldn't normally have worked against the embodiment of Void. Mahagala himself should have been made possible by the combined might of Kengo and Thor's rule of infinitude. However, only two of your attacks land on the exception of Mahakala, possessor of the Immortal Trinity. It's not enough. I need my other hand. Why does it sound like you from With half of your body paralyzed, you can only wield a single sword. You won't be able to use your ultimate technique again for some time. <laughs> Was that the best you could do? Well, too little, too late. It is time. Look up and behold. Berserker announces the end of the world with all the joy of a child on Christmas morning. We shall all bear witness to the show of a lifetime. The falling of the moon. Here and now. 
Field Master Bird activates the sacred artifact and confirms the trajectory using electromagnetic induction. Oh, merciless Queen of Light, ruler of the heavens, Spokoi Nyoi Noshi and Sweet Dreams, forever, harsh mistress! No! We're gonna get crushed by the moon! No! It's too early to give up! Do not slow your approach! Keep moving forward! And when do you get here? Have you been following us? Are you here to help? You are on the right track, but you will need to defeat Trinity simultaneously, or Mahakala will recover. I shall provide the third attack you need! Let's do this now! I command my third eye to open. Let my chakra flow! Ha! Ah! Achieve his cry, the third eye on his forehead slowly opens, blinking sheep sleepily, until the power of the rule commanding the cycle of destruction begins to race through Shiva's body. Whoa, what the heck is that stuff? My third eye possesses a rule that allows it to carry destruction to the far reaches of the universe. I'm sure even Mahakala, the void, is not exempt from this. Now that his third eye is open, Shiva's chakras begin to awaken, from Muladhara the first to Sahasrara the seventh. Then his understanding goes beyond the seventh chakra, ascending to comprehension of all the eight consciousnesses, the Alaya Vijnana. It is said that when a person possesses knowledge of all eight, they will comprehend the meaning beyond the cycles of the universe. I have not yet reached such divine understanding, but the seven chakras alone are all I need to help my fists reach Mahakala. Hey, again, huh? That sure is a popular number. First it means everything, now it's divine understanding. Interesting. Ellie, who had been listening to Shiva's monologue, mumbles this under her breath, like a detective on the brink of solving a mystery. You know, she seemed weirdly interested in on 8 for some reason. Ever since that day, ever since I failed you, I have asked myself the same questions over and over. What is the purpose of my endless training? What significance did those days we spent together have? This long string of questions always began with the same one. Why did he have to fail Vodun Kamadeva? No! At long last, I shall obtain the answer I seek! Perhaps it is an illusion, but for just a moment, the forms of Shiva's past and future selves can be seen behind the, pr the present one. These are manifestations of uh, the faith and the cycle that keeps the universe in motion, which were created by Shiva's rule of destruction. <laughs> Looks like we've got one more shot at this. Let's make this one count, partner. Together! Shine upon my crown, Sahasrara, Seventh Chakra. With my trinity, may galaxies crumble and the world shudder at my command. Let this be the end of you, Crescent Trimurti. Ah! I can't believe we just destroyed the moon. <laughs> the moon's not in a battle zone, right? So... How can it restore itself? Well, I... I guess... If the battle zone... Were they even in the battle zone? I don't even know. Don't ask questions. <laughs> Ending the cycle. Three. Nausea. The soldiers waiting within uh, the Warmongers portal of Stronghold- Oh wait, I completely forgot Naja was actually part of the Warmongers. Um, Stronghold are currently assembled in formation. They are a mixed bunch, composed of both hired mercenaries and Warmonger guild members, but they stand as one. As the executive officer of the Warmongers, I have an order for all warriors present. A little under an hour ago, we confirmed the retreat of the soldiers to the east and south. We will continue to monitor their movements. However, As of this moment, Operation Mahakal is finished, and I am dropping the caution protocol level to two. Huh? But I haven't even got to do anything yet! What does Nasha the Great get a chance to shine? <laughs> now that's the attitude I like to see. Where are you not, my eager friend? The War of the Three Shrew Guilds has only just begun. In fact, 
Why don't you put that impressive mobility of yours to work and head east? As for the rest of you, suffice to say, I have faith that every last soldier here will prove indispensable in this campaign. Hmm. Every last soldier, huh? But you're not including yourself in that, Mr. Fancy White Suit. Why is Kirito here? Kirito is not working. Every single guild Kirito has touched has, like, gone south. I, you know what? I bet Kirito was the one that killed us in the very first uh, time in that happy loop. Be sure to rest up and keep yourself in tip top shape. You'll be called on to serve again in due time. You're dismissed. Good, because I'm sick to death of these battle crazed warriors. Thanks for the coin, suckers. Glad I asked for it in advance. If anyone with paltry powers like mine is planning on sticking around, they're in for a rough time. Anyway, guess I better head south. Time to try my luck with the revolutionaries and conquerors. Off to ghost invaders. Taking advantage of the disorder following the dismissal, Kirito Tach Tachihara disappears into the throng, unseen by a single warrior. So, is that his last name? He fades like a puff of mist, detached from all those around him. Pardon me, O noble source. I wish to inform you of my return. Ah, uh, Counselor Tanajamu, you have rejoined us at last. I am pleased to see you are in one piece. M my lord. Counselor, I shall speak plainly so that there can be no room for misunderstandings between us. I, at least, have no intention of letting you go at present. You are most merciful, my lord. Words cannot express my gratitude. At present, huh? Hmm. He knew about the whole thing, didn't he? What a terrifying man. I needed a means of escalating the situation, a way of moving things along as quickly as possible. I hope you understand. That was the aim of the mission on which I sent you. Hmm. Is there something you'd like to ask me, Counselor Tanatomo, Kano Inusaka? No, of course not. I could never presume to. You have my express permission to do so. Go on. Say what's on your mind. Very well. Tanachama takes a deep breath and reluctantly begins to speak. This world is so wondrously bright and colorful. I failed to appreciate that until now. The darkness that had been enshrouded being Shiva for so long suddenly begins to shimmer. As he looked upon it, his voice grows thick with emotion. He thinks of the innumerable eternities he has witnessed and of the cycle he believed would never end. He thinks of all the days he spent in that same constant darkness and realizes that it now shines within him with the brilliance of a dozen rainbows. It is only now that he has left the city behind that he truly sees how very bright it always was. No, that is not quite true. It does not shine on its own. You make it radiant, Arthur. Shiva does not add that your light seems to make his heart glow like the moon, but the thought crosses his mind. I am sure your reflection in my third eye is brilliant as a thousand suns. When you next meet that Belor fellow, will you tell him that I want to rematch and feature Arthur? It appears he is currently still trapped with an impenetrably dark shadow. Perhaps he still has something left to do in Tokyo. As for me, while I feel as if something is trying to anchor me here, I will be leaving Tokyo behind today of my own volition. For the wish I made upon my arrival has been granted at last. Leaving Tokyo of his own volition? So, not being killed but just leaving, huh. The second the words leave his mouth, Shiva's body begins to fade, becomes thousands of points of brilliant, of, of brilliant light, which trickle away one by one into the sky. Shiva. Arthur. While you may have forgotten our time together, I still recall every last one of those memories we share. And someday, you find that you suddenly remember. I hope you find those memories just as miraculous as I do. Shiva closes his eyes and recalls the days he spent training alone in his homeland. 
Lonely and proud he was back then, he is convinced now that there was an alternative path he could have taken. If he had only been able to see the past, past his own selfish right, if he had only been able to see past his own self-righteousness, he might have found it. However, I don't think I could have gazed upon this brilliance I see before me now had I taken any other path. It is mine alone. It resides within me, as I am an exponent. Shiva wonders if it is possible that you are seeing the same shimmering radiance as he is right now. He concludes that it is probably isn't. This light, he decides, is something that must be found individually. It is something that gains meaning only when that meaning is sought on one's own. It suddenly occurs to Shiva that he might be feeling what Varuna Kamadeva experienced on that fateful day. Was Varuna Kamadeva wishing for his continued happiness in that moment, as he now wished for another's? Everyone is surely born with something forced upon them by the world. Just as the world has forced him to know love, Baruna had likely been compelled into the role of teaching it to him. There was no concrete or logical reason for these occurrences. They were simply outcomes dictated by the world system. Everyone is born with a mind, a body, and aptitudes that they did not choose, and must wrestle with these presets as they live. As individuals, all we can do is give our own meaning to such things. I wish you good fortune and happiness. Arison. Shiva stares into your eyes, smiling at you encouragingly. You just don't know how wonderful you are. And how full it makes my heart to see you prepared to fight on in this never-ending world. We've been through a lot, but... In the end, you were there for me. Shiva? Thank you. Arathen. Ah, I almost forgot. We need to talk about that exception. Shiva's eyes suddenly fly wide, and he fixes you with a serious expression. In order to destroy the exception, Mahakala, you will need to form a pact that will rewrite the current hierarchy. I am talking about a kiss, of course, and since you and I are the ones who brought this exception into being to begin with, the pact must be ours. Like it or not, that is how it's done in this world. I realize this is quite sudden, but I would ask you to prepare yourself, because I will not be holding back. <laughs> nice. Ah, <laughs> uh, you just wanted a kiss, don't you? What are you so happy about? This is a solemn occasion. <laughs> Preposterous. Why should I seek the benefit from a situation like this? This is a duty, plain and simple. <laughs> uh, that momentary blush. <clears throat> I will allow you to choose where the kiss will be placed. Be careful, I am willing to show you such a mercy concerning our history together. Now, your answer, if you please. Hand, chest, elsewhere. Kiss him, his body. <laughs> like, kiss on the lips is pretty good, but like, kiss his body. Holy crap. Someone better tell me what the other option says. <laughs> um. Let's be horny. Kiss his body. I've been kissing everyone on lips, anyways. That's that's a uh, total part one thing. You place one hand on Malkala and you use your other to draw Shiva close. Mm. As you trail your lips along Shiva's skin, you can feel his powerful muscles shudder at your touch. <laughs> that is so degenerate. Meanwhile, unable to maintain their shadowy form any longer, Mahakala starts to dissolve. Fragments of their being seem to fill your mind in a dark cloud until... Where am I? What happened? Don't you see? You were inside the exception, Harrison. This is all that remains of Mahakala, protective of the memories of those who have lost their physical bodies. <laughs> Mr. Mononobi? How? That mechanical bo boy, Rucho, I think his name is. 
He received one of the memories I relinquished. Abruptly, Mr. Nomi extends his hand towards you, and it is some sort of mechanical box that looks very high-tech. He wanted this to be his final show of gratitude to you, for granting his heart's desires. A show of gratitude from Bertro? What do you mean he received your memory? I don't understand. Though lying prone on the ground and quite the worst for wear, Bertro grins up at the sky. It's so beautiful. The sky is sparkling in so many colors, like someone crumbled a rainbow among the stars. Most people believe that the moon will continue to traverse the skies night after night until the end of time. However, just now, he witnessed the shattering of the universe, something he has never seen before. He thinks to himself that if the universe can be broken, then so can anything else. Nothing in this world is indestructible. And he has now proven that beyond a shadow of a doubt. The thought gives him a rush of satisfaction. Virgil. <sighs> is that you, Duo? I can't move a single gear. At these words, Duo notices a small cavity key in Virgil's chest. Wait. What happened to your CMSU? The Critical Memory Storage Unit, or CMSU, is where the memories Virgil inherited as an artificial pillar are supposed to be kept, I see. The other purpose of this device is to store memories of a certain individual who was once eaten by Virgil's mechanical wolf. Hmm. I gave it to someone. Just a little thank you gift. I thought it might be... I thought just might be the one thing he wanted most in the world. It's only natural to want to repay someone for a kind deed, isn't it? He gave me the thing I wanted most of all. So I did the same thing for him. Bircho. You wanted things to end this way all along, didn't you? Upon hearing this from the one designated as his reserve, a spasmodic smile flickers across Bertrand's face. You wanted to see how your life's work was supposed to end before you broke. Hmm. You, I know you wanted to find out if, once destroyed, the heavens and the underworld were subject to being reset. But you honestly didn't mind if it all came to a permanent end, did you? Unable to move his facial parts any longer, Bertrand uses his actuators to force his features into a semblance of a smile. If repetition is both the core of all humor and the foundation of human society. The words he found in the academy library all those years ago remained etched in memory, his memory banks all to this day. Then, duh. I can never truly be considered human. I can't stand repetition. I might be a computer, but I just couldn't tolerate this constant, unending cycle. And the truth comes out. Even after he exchanged his entire human form for a mechanical one, there is still one something within him that he couldn't seem to, to find to replace. Something that was being something that was being worn down was every repetition of the war they fought, cycle after cycle. He had never understood how it was possible, given that instead of a brain, he possessed a durable unit designed to release and absorb intracerebral chemicals. My human emotions stopped functioning a long time ago. Actually, I'm not even sure I had any to begin with. If I did, they were long gone before experiments began. <sighs> but you are human. Duo is confident of his assessment. After all, why else would Bertrand have caused this specific region to be reset? How else could he explain why he had orchestrated things so that everyone but him would be reset? It can only be, thinks Doe, that some hu human warmth yet remains within the device that had been built for the sole purpose of war. Virgil. No. Robert. Duo looks up the f Duo looks upon the features that now only very faintly resemble those of the boy with whom he had once shared a birthplace and friendship. No, please. Call me Virgil. After all, at the end of this repetitive cycle, not even a shadow of his former self remains. He is, in his own opinion, twisted beyond all recognition. Robert, the prodigy child who was born in that laboratory they called Mikami, is nowhere to be found. Because that's who I am. Robert? Virgil? Robert? Virgil? Robert? 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 <laughs> all that's left of him is his name, and even that is jumbled up like the staticky garbled laugh 
that blasts through virtual speakers. It's time to say goodbye. You hear me now? The me who was will simply end. Please, take care of things in my stead. I hope you will do better than I did. Okay, so that's how the Warmonger's arc will end. Not necessarily with the ending of the entire Warmonger's Guild, but instead uh, the replacement of the Guildmaster. And with this, motive shall will probably be shifting too. Don't be ridiculous. I might be reserved, but I am me. And as for you over there in the shadows, have you achieved Chiva's sacred artifact yet? Can you hurry and show yourself ready? Brave? No way! How do you know I was there? I made sure to hide my presence and everything. Even my smell should have been completely gone. I didn't. At least, not until you appeared. Ha ha ha! Baited! But I figured you would be looking around. After all, that's your role, isn't it? To pop up when death is found. <laughs> he says that with a smile. My role has nothing to do with this. I'm here because I chose to be. Because I want to know what your game is and why you modified me. Listen, Break. Whatever you may think, you cannot escape your role. Your role is to feast on the dead and consume their memories. For you are a fragment of the wolf who was once Bertrand's companion. What? Hmm. And he ought to be the one to replace Bertrand and his wolf alongside me. I decide my fate. No one rules me but me. If that is what you want to believe, then I suggest you follow me. And why the heck would I do that? Because I will tell you everything I know and give you the answers you seek. It's a very generous offer, and I recommend that you accept it. In exchange for my information, you will perform various menial tasks for me. To start with, I want you to transport Bertrand to my infirmary. Him? What's the point? He's dead, isn't he? Not quite, but he will be soon unless we get him to the life support system I created for this very purpose over the course of several loops. Wow, that is rather compassionate of Duo. Going out of his way to build a life support system for the people you know he's going to be replacing. I am a genius, Break. You would do well to remember that. Now do as I say. Duo enjoys calling himself a genius because he knows it to be true, and he doesn't need anyone else to recognize him as one. After all, even if, say, someone abnormally called him a second rate, why should he care? His older brother had admitted his genius, and that is all that matters. Ah, he cares about his brother. But if, he, if he's a genius, he has to act like one. And if he's going to be a genius, he wants to be the ultimate genius, who will solve all of this world's problems. Alright, kid. If you got yourself a deal, I'll do it. Without any further ado, Break scoops up Burjo, feeling a strange sort of deja vu. As he does, the mechanical boy he had thought that speaks, making him jump. Stop! Don't do this, duo! If the electrical masters find out that you did not dispose of me, a broken part of the system, they'll... I have yet to report to Plan C. Current. I have no intention of informing anyone that you require a replacement. What about Plan A? Oh, Duo doesn't intend to replace Bertro? He intends to fully repair him, even though he gave away part of his heart, like the thing that houses his memories, the artificial pillar, as well as uh, his memories of the boy. I can't believe he's giving that all. He's still uh, rescuing him here in that sense. Plan A being uh, the Guildmaster of the Invaders, which we have yet to see. The one we call Isaac will not let you be your betrayal go unpunished. Surely you realize this. Hmm. He cares about his friend. Friend of the past. If I know anything about Isaac, good master of the invaders, and a revolutionary prodigy behind plan A, that is evolution through assimilation. Then I can only conclude that your defiance of the system has long been discovered. Evolution through assimilation. Virtual mentioned that his own sort of, uh... What's it called? His own sort of plan was about uh, evolution through warfare. So maybe their name, like, uh, their plans are, the plans themselves are related to uh, the name of the guild. The warmongers, obviously, like, it seems like they just commit war, but more than that, it seems that they want to evolve through combat and uh, warfare and destruction. Uh, and it seems that in this case, you might be seeing the invaders uh, instead believe in plan A, which uh, is related to evolution through assimilation. Or invading and uh, you know, co conquering and just uh, 
as for lack of better words, assimilating. Or annexing, I guess. And this Tokyo. There are three shell prodigies. So once monitored the critical twenty-three as they monitored you. When the loops had worn me down to the nearest shadow, these prodigies took my memories and split them into three pieces. One for each to keep. What remained of me should have been snuffed out then and there, but Mahakal protected me. Wait a minute. Why does that story sound so familiar? Sheena? In any case, the me who is talking to you right now is only the third of the man I once was. So, what we received just now, the core, was in Bircher's memories, or maybe it was... Not that Bircher probably has his own memory, so... His core retains the artificial, artificial power as well as, but Mr. Ronan, no, nobody's memories. Um, but for some reason, we seem to... Uh... Hmm. Oh, I see. Maybe the... The Itakenshi are related to Chino's memories or something? His persistence. I know Chino's supposed to be, uh, has been, is supposed to have upkept his existence just through the memory of his loved one. Uh, but I don't really know the details to all of that. Maybe it's like they're housed in the eight spiritual orbs. It's a miracle I'm even able to talk to you like this right now. And one I'm very grateful for. I'm glad too, but why did they take your memories? Did they really have to split them? So Mahakal protected some memories of some kind. Okay, so it wasn't an, a clean th three-way cut. Apparently Mahakala preserved uh, the last vestiges after it was split to three. That's interesting. My memories are the most important thing that exists in this Tokyo. I don't mean that in a self-important way. I'm only talking about the memories. It's my original who was important, not me. I'm merely the vessel who received a small portion of my original's memories. To put it simply, I am a copy designed to act on that person's behalf in this Tokyo. You're a copy? You got someone else's memories too? Who's your original? An exception. Possessing omnipotence and omniscience. The manifestation of all things in this world. Interesting. I don't really know how to describe this, but okay. Exception of all. An elusive being who looks upon this Tokyo from the distant heavens above. No, I don't recognize what this is. An exception called Solomon. Oh, wow. We have Art of Solomon. This is actually the very first time I've seen this. Oh, wow. Christine's four star art, Ashley. Oh, what a splendid stage this turned out to be. Such a spectacular spectacle. We entertainers have outdone ourselves this time. I am certain that our omniscient benefactor will be most pleased. Omniscient benefactor? Christine dances and sings alongside the many masks she has collected throughout her lifetime. Now, the game will evolve into a brand new stage, wiping the slate clean in the Tokyo. I dearly hope our friend is pleased. I do so want to see the stage made more enjoyable than ever before. Are they taking orders from Solomon? The entertainer sent us? He agreed, don't you? Wouldn't it be wonderful to see those brilliant children uh, do so ever so much more, Lian and Chi. Oh my gosh, <laughs> she's here. Kawaii! Hmm. After his web conference with Senator Minamoto, Plot sits alone in the office, deep in thought. Master Claude, I have to report for you. The three true guilds appear to have withdrawn, if only temporarily. We will continue to gather intelligence alongside the summoners and wise men, though I doubt we will see action anytime soon. Thank you, Snow. Actually, it's a good thing you're here. Is there something I can do for you, Master Claude? Perhaps. Do you recall the report you made to us here? Once, before recording the app displaying the elemental all round. I do, Master. 
That was the day he arrived in Shijuku, was it not? Arison, that is. Yeah, I remember this. It was like one of the very few instances that actually explicitly referred to uh, people's attributes. Master, I do apologize for disrupting your rest. I have a report for you. Very well. An app battle was observed several hours ago in Shinjuku Central Park. One side consisted of several Oni Street transients, the other human, judging by appearance. As far as we can tell, it matches no other transient in our records. According to the reports by Scouting Region, this unidentified being's rule is rending. Oh, rending, is it? So the long anticipated rare has finally appeared. Precisely so, Master. Although the existence of the rule of rending itself was already predicted, this is the first instance of it actually being observed in Tokyo, as far as I am aware. What? Well, obviously they didn't have intel on the loops, but it seems strange they wouldn't have heard of this at least. Well, I don't know. If you're in the dark, then you're really in the dark. What is the attribute of their artifact? If it's either, perhaps it's the shears of the three crones, or the time elder scythe. My master, it appears to be none of those. It is neither fire nor water, nor is it infernal. The app is this plane, all round. You see, we recently received some interesting information from Senator Minamoto. Hmm. He's even more of a devil than we thought. He fully intends to use us for all we are worth to him. Anyway, the Senator told us that, while true administrator of this app has yet revealed themselves. So the Guild Masters... Um, not the, the game masters who are responsible for the app in the game. Yeah, we still don't know anything about them besides, uh, for some reason, uh, Alice is just casually part of them. Should the All One encounter all eight exceptions, this administrator is guaranteed to appear in this Tokyo. The All One. Okay, so what we have so far is. So there's eight exceptions in total for every. I, no, wait, there are nine attributes. There won't be one for All Around then. Um, we've met the fire. Uh, we've met the fire exception, uh, Jean de Orleans. Uh, we've met the water exception of, uh, Fisher King. The wood exception of, uh, Fisher King. Uh, the, the Easter exception of Thor. And the another exception of Yogg-Sothoth. I guess, uh, Shiva's Mahakala would be the infernal exception. Uh, who was the, the protector of the memories of the, what's it called? Who, who, mem memories who lost their original forms, aka shadows. So we still have two more to go in, uh, Valiant as well as World. This should be interesting. In addition to that, we also have two more objectives that we need to be uh, aware of. Uh, collecting the two other cores from the other Guildmasters so that we can make Mr. Nobi whole. We're starting to finally have a roadmap to our like, uh, objective of figuring out this loop and ending it. And getting more information from the game master uh administrator should probably be uh be essential to us ending the, the loops this person is all-knowing and the exception of all elements oh so there are nine exceptions um i see and the ninth one will only appear after the first eight so that's the significance of eight that's why ellie was so interested in it so now, our faithful butler, we would like you to gather all the information you possibly can regarding the All One. Of course, Master Claude. In fact, I have already taken the liberty of looking into the matter ever since that day. I actually have a message from Toji and the other summoners on a subject that I can relate to you now. A certain app user named Minato Ward, whom had been monitoring, has recently displayed the element all round. Would this be Christine? Oh, now that is interesting. Whew, okay. Looks like things have finally settled down over there. Time for me to get started on my plan. Oh, hello? Yeah, I can hear you. Ellie grins to herself as she answers the call mid-flight. Alright then. Thanks, Tanatama. C consider yourself debt free. Hmm, you don't like the way I said that. <laughs> ah, you're so uptight, Tanatama. More and more, you remind me of a certain someone from Kabuki Shop. You know who I mean. Actually, you know what? I bet we could be great friends if you loosen up a little and stop calling me dumb. <laughs> oh, calm down. It was just a suggestion. Okay, talk to you later. Yep, I'll let you know. 
Bye. Using the information she had received from Tanatomo as a guide, Ellie sets off to the night sky towards her destination. Right, so. What was it you wanted again? You wanted to tell me something? Don't play dumb. You know exactly what my question was. After all the pain it caused you, what possessed you to save me? Uh, you really didn't have some deep, complicated reason, but I guess if I had to put some logic to it. Shino! Oh my gosh. Are they trying to revive him? Well, that'd be too good to be true. I saw some kind of glittery ball slip out of your shirt, and it had the symbol of wisdom for it. Seeing you with that shiny thing, I was reminded of someone who once lived in Capriccio. At the time, I really didn't like him. He was always finding fault with me and the way I said things. Okay, so I was just reminded by him. You could even say I hated him. I just wanted him to get off my back. Why should I tell him where I was going before I headed out on my nightly strolls? And the biggest irony of all that is he disappeared without a word while I was out. Talk about hypocritical. I've never heard from him since, and I hate him all the more for it. Because he never gave me a chance to tell him the truth. That I actually didn't hate him at all. I guess Tana Tama knows. So, if you really feel like you owe me, mind lending me a hand. That depends. Tell me what you want me to do first. You're one of those eight dog warriors, right? That means there should be more of you around here. You smell the same as someone I'm searching for. Someone from an old memory of mine. I was hoping you might be able to help me with that. Know anything useful? Hmm. According to Town and Tom's info, I should be heading south. Okay, this is probably referring to uh, Masanori then. <laughs> yeah, there it is. The first person I need to look for is the invader's necromancer, Masanori Daikaku Inumura. I think that's the right name. As she soars effortlessly through the sky, uh, the inky sky above Tokyo, Ellie thinks back on a story she was once told. For though he hadn't spent very long with the outlaws, Shino had had enough time to pass on a decent amount of information to her. Shino. Eight memories had torn Shino's body apart and escaped into the world. Yeah, it's just like uh, Mr. Mononobi. They took the form of glittering orbs, which then scattered in all directions. When he came to Tokyo, Shino found that the eight individuals had come into possession of each of these orbs, the eight dog warriors. Shino had been happy to find that his will had been inherited by others. He told her, with some embarrassment, that he considered them his soul children. And expressed his earnest desire to meet them all. Aww. To which Ellie replied that he sounded like an old grandpa. <laughs> then, before she had a chance to get involved, Shino had vanished from Kapukicho. And Ellie hadn't forgotten how, for several weeks, Suzuku, Gyobu, and the other outlaw members had walked around with eyes red from crying. <laughs> no! No, this is so sad. <laughs> Damn it, Shino. It always bugged me how I couldn't do anything about it. I I'm meant to be the queen. Besides, even if I'm curious about those memories Shino left behind. Apparently, Shino had left of his own accord after achieving his life's ambition. So even if she was to gather all eight of the orbs, she didn't think it would be enough to make him come back. Hmm. That didn't stop her from wondering how about the contents of the memories he had left behind, however. Hmm. This is very proactive of her. I'm not sure what the uh, the ends to these means are, but I think it's worth investigating. Uh, Ellie knows instinctively that the core of the situation is in terms of remedy. Yeah, it is kind of being nosy. But, yeah. However, in spite of this fact, or perhaps because of it, she cannot stay away. The allies have a place in this. She can feel it in her gut. And who dares doubt the Queen of Kobiki show? She can. It's only natural for her to be involved after, you know. Just uh, her not getting a chance to get to know Shino better, as she said. She, she missed the chance to say she didn't hate him, and she, in fact, uh, seems that everyone carried, everyone in the Outlaws carried his will, and she wants to make good on that. Honor him in some way. Well then, south it is. Portal here gone. So there may not, there may not be uh, ends to these means, but there may be, and really, at least some sort of personal satisfaction of it. I'll wait to mourn. Wherever your memories are, I will find them and bring them to you.
Don't give up hope, Mr. Murnobi. Mm. I'm sure you will attempt to do just that, no matter what I say. And strangely, the thought makes me happy. Besides, even if I want to stop you, I cannot. It seems my time is up. What do you... No, 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 we just got a piece of you. You're fading, Mr. Nolnobi. I suppose, but being a third of my farm itself, I have only so many words in me. So before I run out entirely, listen well. A revolution is coming to this game in this Tokyo as we speak, Arthur. The aim of this movement is to change everything and everyone, including you. A revolution? Change us how? The invaders. The Valentine crew? Hmm. She, it seems like the Valentine crew has a special interest in the, in the invaders for something, especially Tomichin. Uh, with, uh, what's it called? It's probably because she is that reserved from Olympus I mentioned before. Humans change. That is only natural. If someone remains unchanged for a very long time, that is only because they are sacrificing something of which you are unaware. I may not be able to stop you, but I can warn you, at least. You must not sacrifice yourself. Do not let your desires save me consume you. All I care about is your well-being. Yours and that of my other students. I'll keep that in mind. My only wish is for all of you to be safe. If I were to be granted one final wish, I would ask to see you and your classmates graduate. Nothing would bring me more joy than to see you escape the clutches of this unending cycle and head out into the world to make your mark on it. For now, however, you should go back and rest. Let sleep and relaxation wash away your mental and physical fatigue. And thank you for coming to see me, Arthur. Thank you. Well, guess the moon's not longer destroyed. A new objective to complete. A new vow to uphold. Done. The battle you have been fighting will soon progress to a whole new level. Neat. Wait, what? Was that the end of chapter 10? I mean, chapter 11? It didn't even say chapter 11 end. You know, the, the thing where it's like the end of an, an event or a chapter, it always says that. It didn't say it this time. What the heck? That was abrupt. But it was good. I liked it a lot. Um. Damn. I didn't expect it to finish in this chapter. Okay. That concludes chapter 11, The Moon at War. Um, to summarize all the events that happened, after we left the Penitentiary Academy and returned back to our lives, um, we had just, uh, what happened after that? We, yes, it, we had, uh, Tezcatlipoca passed away, and we had uh, been the impetus for the war between the three true guilds. I mean, they were always at war, but uh, in this case, we set the balance to go off scale. And uh, that set ablaze uh, the wars in the south and east against uh, the w the west. And what we saw was two ultimate weapons uh, combined into one. I guess there was one ultimate weapon along that was orchestrated by Yuri Tomo and uh, Bertro, the guildmaster, as well as uh, Mephistopheles, whose role I'm actually not too quite sure of. Um, but he may have been, like, the mediator to Mahakala himself. And it seems that uh, Mahakala uh, was be able to house the memories of Mr. Mononobi all the time, at least the fragments that weren't taken by the three guildmasters. And, uh, yeah, their, their aim was for them to uh, swap roles of, and become 
one in a sense. Let's share the same body anyways. And for the destruction of Tokyo. And it seems that, that Bertrand's end goal in that was a selfish one. So it's, it was very calamitous, but in the end it was just for a simple trifling reason of uh, Bertrand was a... Uh, seemed to be breaking down and he wanted to... Yeah, th that was the whole uh, reason for Chapel. He was breaking down and he didn't know why he's breaking down every passing loop because of something that was missing in him. So he decided he wanted to see uh, if he could see the end of his the world with his uh, plan B. Uh, and see if it was even possible before the end of his lifetime. And uh, he succeeded, and that's what he was happy to, uh, uh, to receive. And as a result, he gifted me, the protagonist, Ayrton, with the core, the ICMSC or something, which has, is an artificial pillar that houses the memories of Mr. Mononobe. That's uh, quite a lot. Shiba and Mahakala. We also got... I think the best thing that the story did was it opened up a lot more plot points uh, that needs uh, that will be pursued. Uh, we learned about, through Ellie, which seemed like a very random uh, plot in the middle of it, but later on, it, her interest in eight was revealed to be related to the Hakenshi dog warriors. Um, and he's interested in, I guess, honoring Chino's will, his uh, passing, by finding out what those memories are all about. Um, through their orbs, and he asked Tanajama to cooperate with him to uh, find them. Cooperate with her, that is. Besides uh, finding uh, the, the eight dog wars, I mean, I guess that has always been implicitly a goal for fans, but in terms of, like, set as an objective by someone in this story, that was never an objective at all. But now there's some sort of consistency among them. And I, I, now they explain it, I understand their, their relationship. It's only just like a, he's kind of just spiritually their father, not their actual father. So they have no, like, a genetic relation. They just happen to carry over his uh, will through specific aspects of it, whether it be it a, a filial piety or wisdom or things like that. Now, I wonder what made them attract those orbs in the first place, but I guess that's just deeper into the story of the Hakenshi. Hmm. And besides that, yeah, we also received a new goal of being uh, finding the cores from the other two guild, mem uh, guild masters, which we don't know anything about right now uh, for the invaders, who is uh, Isaac. We already know uh, Bircho's plan B uh, was originally Robert, and we also know about uh, Curran. We also know of the objectives between each guild now. Uh, plan A, sorry, Plan A, uh, Plan B, uh, Bircho is being the evolution of the human race. Um, that's a new thing that they mentioned. It's weird that uh, they were aiming for something like evolution, as abstract as that. Before we were just I thought the objective was about, like, the, what's it called, the, the placing of one mythology above all others, but apparently it's going beyond that, uh, and that might be related to, uh, what's it called, it might be related to the, the Game Masters, actually, something even be, that goes as, like, a layer above the desire for one mythology to, to rule supreme. So we know from the Warmongers that they have the objective of being, uh, what's it called, ev evolving for through warfare, and uh, co conflict and battle and destruction, and or plan A um, with Isaac, which we still have never seen. Uh, we know that he, their plan of invading requires assimilation. I don't really understand uh, the rule makers deal yet though with uh, plan C, Karen. I already forget her like actual name, it's like Charles or something, yeah it's probably Charles. And uh, yeah. It's, but most likely the common factor is evolution of the human race. So maybe that's the layer that the game masters are coming from. The spare duo was raised with these three uh, other guild masters, uh, and they they seem to not have an affiliation with a single guild. I mean, they do now, but like they had to be made from somewhere common. Uh, those are experiments that they were referring early to before. I'm confused by it. They said they escaped from the east, so the experiments happened there, but I'm not fully convinced that it was just from the rule maker's doings. Uh, it seems that they would only really cooperate with having three, um, three guild masters that would equally benefit each one if it was held by an independent party, and I think that would be, would be the game masters, which we saw. Um, they seem to be making a movement now uh, with Leanne and she and, and uh, Christine 
as uh, Claude pointed out, they saw a movement coming from uh, another all around there uh, spying on. Uh, so, yeah, plot threats follow. The Ken Hakenshi finding them. Uh, the three cores, we now have one of them for Mr. Mononobi's memories. And uh, the objectives of the three guilds and the layer on top of that being the game masters. I'm curious how this pans out. Before then, if it's just a. Chapter 10 was like pretty good, but uh, I had a friend, Irby, uh, who joins me in discussions, um, <laughs> mentioned that he didn't like how um, most of the actual significant details only happen in the end. And I mean, I guess he has half a point in terms of that. I still like the story, but um, it seems like the only outcome, granted, significant outcome, was uh, the initiation of the, the toppling of the balance between the three guilds and uh, making them fight each other. But in this one, it's not just like starting that impetus, but now it's, we have goals. It's not just being afraid, and it's it's not just trying to make them fight each other. We now have targets ourselves, too. And I think that's impressive, something tangible that we can work towards. I don't know, all the characters are really fleshed out pretty well. Uh, like, even the ones who like only showed up in the last possible seconds, like Tita. Uh, <laughs> I mean, they had a pretty sparkling appearance in the end, and Marduk's uh, appearance like uh, was a bit funny. With him being born randomly in a Melvis story. I don't know, they all seem like lively characters. I like them. Uh, Shiva's was... <laughs> I mean, I knew it was gonna end up like that in the end with him, like, saying he loved them. Or, you know, confessing feelings. But it was still really sweet, and his, like, momentary blushes were telling of it. Uh, I wonder which is, was hornier, casting him in lips or casting him in body. I will never know. And... Yeah. Ellie... Was role was really right in the middle with her backstory. Didn't really get that, but I like her connection to the Hakenshi. Shows some responsibility and shows she's not some, this, some dumb girl that Tanatomo was calling her. Um, responsibly with that as well as uh, with uh, listening to the desires and the feelings of her fellow guild members. Well, I have run out of thoughts, so thank you for joining me. Uh, in the series of playthroughs, I am going to take a long walk and think about where this story may keep going from now. I enjoyed it, and I hope you guys did too. Well, I will see you guys next time. Goodbye.